Welcome to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons webinar on readmissions after coronary artery bypass surgery. I am Dr. Gaetano Payone, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the STS Task Force on Quality Initiatives, which will be presenting this, the fifth in the STS webinar series. Our speakers will be Dr. David Shaheen, Vice President at the Center for Quality and Safety at the Massachusetts General Hospital. David also serves as the chair of the STS Council on Quality Research and Patient Safety Operating Board, as well as the chair of the STS Quality Measurement Task Force. Dr. Frank Shannon from the William Beaumont Hospital and the William Beaumont School of Medicine in Troy, Michigan. Dr. Kevin Lobdell, the director of quality at the Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute in the Carolinas Healthcare System. And Dr. William Kane from the Intermountain Heart Institute in Utah. We begin the webinar with a presentation by Dr. David Shaheen. My name is Dave Shaheen, and I'm going to be starting this webinar with a brief review of the issue of readmissions, particularly the federal government's interest in readmissions and the readmission reduction program that's been implemented. I'll also provide you with some background on some of the studies that have been done on cabbage readmissions, and then I'll be turning the program over to my colleagues who will provide you with some practical examples from their own experiences as to how to uh, reduce readmission for cardiac surgery and specifically coronary bypass surgery. The interest of the federal government in reducing readmissions probably dates back to at least June of 2007 with this report by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission on promoting greater efficiency in the Medicare system. They indicate in this report that hospital readmissions are sometimes indicators of poor care or missed opportunities to better coordinate care, and that this has resulted in additional Medicare spending. They uh, indicate a readmission rate within 30 days of 17.6%, accounting for $15 billion in spending. And they acknowledge that while not all of these readmissions are avoidable, some are. In this figure taken from that report, the percentage point difference between actual and expected readmission rates are plotted. And as you can see, some hospitals have far lower readmission rates than expected, while others have a significantly higher readmission rates than expected. So there is great variation across hospitals and a lot of opportunity uh, for improvement. There was a follow-up report by the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission the following year in 2008 in which they indicate that Congress should require the Secretary of HHS to confidentially report readmission rates and resource use to hospitals and physicians, and that the Secretary should be directed to reduce payments to hospitals with relatively high readmission rates. In this New England Journal of Medicine article from 2009, the following year, Steve Jenks and colleagues uh, presented this very important information about rehospitalization trends in the Medicare fee for service program, in which they found that almost a fifth of the nearly 12 million Medicare beneficiaries who'd been discharged from the hospital during the 2003 2004 period had been rehospitalized and 34% within 90 days. Importantly, in about half of the patients who were rehospitalized within 30 days, after a medical discharge, there was no bill for a visit to a physician's office between the time of discharge and rehospitalization. So the conclusion was that there was an opportunity to reduce the rate of readmissions if patients were simply seen on a more timely basis uh, by their uh, community physician after a hospital discharge. This study by Harlan Krumholtz and colleagues in the same year showed that cardiovascular admissions, specifically acute myocardial infarction and heart failure, had similar broad distributions across institutions, again, creating opportunity for improvement. Another factor that Congress took into consideration is the fact that going back at least to 2002, the readmission rates for the three index conditions reported on hospital compare had essentially not changed at all. So there had been no improvement. All of this led, ultimately, in 2010, 
to Section 3025 of the Affordable Care Act, the so-called Hospital Readmission Reduction Program, in which uh, the Secretary of HHS was uh, directed to reduce payments to hospitals uh, with excess readmissions, and this readmission reduction program was then implemented by CMS. In this program, hospital reimbursement for all its discharge are reduced if their readmission rate for certain index procedures, initially these were AMI, heart failure, and pneumonia, exceeded predicted values. The program began in 2013 with a maximum 1% reduction, which increased over several years to 3% in 2015. In 2015, the number of diagnoses for which readmission rates were monitored expanded to include chronic obstructive lung disease and joint replacement, and in 2017, coronary artery bypass surgery be included as well. Also of note, in the 2011 report of the Department of Health and Human Services to Congress, avoiding unnecessary rehospitalizations was part of the HHS National Quality Strategy, again reinforcing its importance in the eyes of the federal government. Uh, but there are, however, some issues with readmission penalties, which I'll briefly summarize. First, in order to be readmitted, you have to survive your index admission. And there are some data to suggest that some hospitals are able to salvage very seriously ill patients. They're discharged, and then they do have a higher risk of coming back to be readmitted. But those same patients may not even have survived the index admission at another hospital. So you really should always look at readmission rates together with index hospital survival rates. Secondly, the determination of what a preventable readmission is is often quite difficult to ascertain. There are some automated algorithms that will do this, but chart review is probably the most accurate, and it still is quite subjective in many cases. Determining what an excess readmission is is also difficult because that requires that you have an expected value. And as I'll show you in a few minutes, determination of expected readmission rates, which depends on risk models for readmission, can be quite problematic. Should you include socioeconomic or sociodemographic factors, since there are data to suggest that these are quite important in determining readmission risk? Some argue in favor of this, some argue against it, and there is an ongoing trial at the National Quality Forum exploring this issue. Hospitals serving vulnerable populations argue that these factors should be included, whereas others are concerned that inclusion of these factors in risk models may adjust away disparities in care. Hospitals also are concerned that they are being held accountable for things over which they have no control, such as the home environment of patients. And then there are potential unintended negative consequences. There are data suggesting that readmission penalties may disproportionately penalize safety net and other hospitals serving disadvantaged populations. And there is also concern that readmission penalties may discourage appropriate early readmissions that actually may prevent more serious problems from developing. With regard to the issue of preventable readmissions, the most credible determinations come from chart reviews by expert clinicians, and these typically reveal lower rates of preventability than those from automated algorithms. However, clinician review is not feasible to scale, and for profiling purposes, some sort of risk-adjusted automatic rate-based approach. Estimating expected readmission rates requires that a risk model be developed based on risk factors that the patient presents with. However, the range of these risk factors of readmission is much greater than that mortality risk, and some, can be argued, are not under the control of the index hospital. Things like patient characteristics and illness severity on admission certainly seem to be reasonable predictors. The quality of care during the index admission may impact readmission. Discharge and transition planning, again, something that is quite reasonably felt to be the responsibility of the hospital. Local environmental factors, inadequate community health care resources, for example, may or may not be or may partially be under the control of hospitals. Socioeconomic factors, as I've indicated, may be either risk-adjusted or stratified. Patients may have recurrence of their original chronic condition. Heart failure is a good example of this. Or they may develop a new condition. And finally, readmission rates are also a function of the local 
immunity threshold to admit patients, which studies have shown vary substantially across uh, areas. In general, risk models that have been developed to predict readmission risk have rather mediocre performance compared with mortality risk models, and hospitals argue that they do not receive credit for some of the most important risk factors for readmission, such as caring for vulnerable populations. Because of these suboptimal models and the rather high stakes of these models, there's increased potential for adverse unintended consequences. For example, there may be denial of care to patients who are felt to be at high risk of readmission who might thus lead a hospital to be declared an outlier. If there are excessive penalties for hospitals serving disadvantaged populations, you are essentially taking from the poor and giving to the rich. And finally, as I indicated previously, in this kind of environment, there may be a reluctance to readmit patients who in fact should be readmitted. And this is work by Karen Joint and Ashish Jha, published in JAMA in 2013 showing that uh, larger teaching hospitals and safety net hospitals are the most likely ones to be penalized. Well, let's focus now on the issue of cabbage readmission. In the case of coronary bypass surgery, readmissions may be considered a marker of care quality and an opportunity to improve care. Most cabbage readmissions are unplanned. They result either from the delayed occurrence of a complication or the delayed recognition of a complication. In general, as I'll show you, they're not a result of shorter length of stay initiatives. The mortality in readmitted patients is high, so again, there's an opportunity to improve overall care if we can identify the causes for readmission and try to prevent them. And finally, readmission and mortality rates are complementary uh, performance measures. They do not necessarily track together. Cabbage readmissions occur relatively frequently and have a substantial financial impact. And if you count visits to the emergency department that don't result in readmission, it actually doubles the number of returns to the hospital, all of which you'd like to reduce. There's also ascertainment issues. About 50% of cabbage readmissions go to a hospital other than the index hospital. For example, a large referral hospital may not see all of its cabbage patients that are readmitted because they may go to the hospital in their community, which may be quite a distance away. As in the case with readmission rates for the index procedures, which I showed you earlier, there has been a lack of improvement over the years in cabbage readmission rates as well. There's also significant inter-hospital variation in rates. And for all these reasons, CMS is adding cabbage as a readmission target. As my colleagues will describe in a few minutes, there are a number of feasible opportunities for improving cabbage readmission, addressing common readmission causes before discharge, educating patients, families, cardiologists, and PCPs, always having the original surgeon or their team contacted before a patient is readmitted, and having outpatient visits by MPs or PAs, sending smartphone pictures, videos, and having earlier return visits to the clinic. One of the earliest studies of readmission after cardiac procedures actually came from my department at Leahy Clinic in 1999, in which the most common readmission problems were related to congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, chest pain, wound problems, and GI problems. Of note, discharge earlier, on or before the fifth post-operative day, was associated with a lower prevalence of subsequent readmissions, not higher. And importantly, about half of these readmissions were to hospitals other than the index hospital. These data from that study show that most readmissions occur early, so there's an opportunity to mitigate these early readmissions. Vic Ferraris and his colleagues at Kentucky did another study of readmissions after cardiac surgery and found a very similar common causes to the study which we did at Leahy including cardiac causes in about 42%, either chest pain, heart failure, or rhythm problems, pulmonary issues in about 19%, typically pleural effusions, uh, pneumonia or COPD exacerbations, 10% GI or GU problems, then a variety of other problems, including wound uh, issues, extremity complications, metabolic disturbances, and late stroke. In a 10-center prospective observational study conducted 
by the National Institutes of Health and the Canadian Institute of Health Research Cardiothoracic Surgical Trials Network. The causes of readmissions occurring less than 30 days and greater than 30 days were similar to those in the previous two studies I mentioned, and some of the risk factors associated with readmission included diabetes, female sex, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, long duration operations. In this work by Ed Hannon in New York, you can see that when you plot risk-adjusted readmission rate and readjusted 30-day mortality rate on the same graph that the correlation coefficient is only 0.32. So these two endpoints are only weakly correlated. They're measuring different things. There are also issues identified in the literature regarding the reliability of readmission rates as a measure of hospital quality. This is work from Justin Dimmick's group at the University of Michigan in which 55% of the variation in readmission rates was noise. 41% represented true signal in readmission rates. Only 4.4% of hospitals achieved a level of reliability exceeding 0.7 in the measurement of their readmission rate, which would require 599 cases. We were asked by CMS and the Yale core group to work with them on the development of a 30-day readmission measure for coronary bypass surgery based on STS clinical registry data. This work was published in circulation in 2014. The final study cohort consisted of 162,572 admissions at 1,012 hospitals. This table from that paper shows the odds ratios for various risk factors associated with uh, readmission. Not surprisingly, patients on dialysis, patients who were reoperations, patients with severe chronic lung disease, uh, diabetes, and other uh, risk factors were related to increased readmission rates. The C statistic for this model was only 0.631 when the model was based only on preoperative factors and no socioeconomic status variables. This is a fairly typical C statistic for a readmission model, and this fairly low level of discrimination is much lower than the comparable C statistics for a mortality model. As you can see from the work we did in conjunction with that study, the risk-adjusted readmission rates in the STS population of providers varied substantially from about 13% up to 23%, so similar degree of variation we actually repeated the analyses in this model after adding ethnicity, various categories of race, and various payer categories. You can see in this table the readmission rates for these various risk factors that we examined. Interestingly, when you plot risk standardized readmission rate with and without socioeconomic variables, as in this figure, the Pearson correlation coefficient was 0.995, and only 8 out of 846 hospitals actually changed classification. The outlier status, uh, based on the two models, agreed for 99.1% of all hospitals. There were a few hospitals where the classification rate changed. Typically, uh, hospitals that had very high proportions of vulnerable populations moved to a higher performance classification when SES factors were included, and hospitals that had very high levels of commercial payer patients. So in summary, readmissions are a major national concern. There is very substantial inter-hospital variation in readmission rates. Most readmission prediction models, including those for cabbage, perform poorly compared with mortality or morbidity risk models. In our analysis, at least, SES factors uh, do not change cabbage performance classification for the vast majority of hospitals, and we think that there is a potential to mitigate the likelihood of readmission. With that, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Dr. Frank Shannon, from the uh, William Beaumont Hospital who will discuss approaches to reducing readmissions after isolated cabbage. This is Frank Shannon. Over the next 15 minutes, I would like to present some guidelines to reduce avoidable readmission. These recommendations are based on my review of the literature and represent a root cause approach to quality improvement. 
As Dr. Shaheen has well described, hospital readmission rates after isolated cabbage have become a new metric for measuring the quality of cardiac surgical care. When evaluated within the context of risk modeling and quality improvement, the risk factors for surgical morbidity and mortality are different than those for readmission. When compared, the RFs for readmission are inconsistently related to each other, are difficult to control or neutralize in the clinical setting, and are often surrogates for frailty. From a quality improvement perspective, reducing readmissions requires a bundled approach. This means that multiple components of perioperative care need to be addressed in order to achieve a significant reduction in readmissions. There are three features of cardiac surgical care that make bundling necessary. First, there are multiple unrelated causes of readmission, which individually have a low incidence. Secondly, complications of surgery account for a significant percentage of readmissions. Most of these are unavoidable unless the complication profile is excessive. Third, socioeconomic class and insurance coverage have a significant influence on readmission rates, but are unchangeable even with health care reform. Specific strategies to reduce readmission rates can be divided into three categories. The first involves better perioperative care focused on achieving strict glycemic control and reducing the incidence of retained blood syndrome. The second category is concerned with following evidence-based management protocols for the three common postoperative complications of atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, and pleural effusions. The final category is centered on proactively identifying patients who are at higher risk for readmission by virtue of their comorbidity profile and adjusting perioperative management accordingly. Over the past 10 years, there have been 10 good papers published that identify the causes of readmission after cabbage. Four of these are based on administrative data from mandatory statewide cardiac surgery databases from California and New York. In these, the primary cause for readmission is based on DRG definitions and obtained from retrospective review of billing records for cabbage patients. The advantages of these data sets are that the volume of cases and capture of all readmissions, regardless of hospital, are done. The clinical papers are mostly single-center retrospective reviews of medical records with physician adjudication of the primary cause for readmission. The advantage of these reviews is that the reasons for readmission are more clinically accurate. Despite the differences in methodology, the top five DRG causes for readmission are identical to the clinical list. The numbers shown in the tables are the percentages of all readmissions due to that specific diagnosis or cause. These tables are useful because they list the top five out of approximately 20 to 25 of the primary reasons for readmission and as such represent approximately 40 to 50 percent of these causes. They represent the areas of treatment improvement that should be guided by updated protocols. Measures to reduce surgical site infections, pleural effusions, and atrial fibrillation are relatively straightforward. Dealing with readmission due to chest pain is less clear because causes may range from incisional sternotomy pain to recurrent myocardial ischemia. Future studies should be done to identify chest pain cause so that better management can be accomplished. In a similar way, congestive heart failure or fluor overload is more nonspecific and likewise needs better elucidation in future studies. In terms of addressing the most frequent cause of readmissions, glycemic control emerges as an overarching priority for reducing the incidence of SSIs in cardiac surgery patients. STS guidelines recommend maintaining blood sugar below 180 mg per deciliter with continuous IV insulin infusions from the induction of anesthesia to postoperative day three. The literature supporting tight glycemic control was summarized by Borland et al. in a recent meta-analysis. The authors searched the literature for studies of tight glycemic control in cardiac surgery patients comparing continuous IV insulin infusions with bolus doses of subcutaneous insulin guided by a sliding scale. 
The blood sugar target ranged from 160 to 200 milligrams per deciliter in these studies. 40 out of 1,700 studies were initially reviewed to yield 13 articles describing 11 reviews. The endpoints were the incidence of all surgical site infections within one year after cardiac surgery in 11 studies and all SSIs plus hospital readmissions within one year of cardiac surgery in two others. As listed on the top portion of this graph, a total of four randomized control tiles with a total of 388 patients were studied. The target glucose was less than 200 in both groups. In the lower portion of the graph, seven cohort studies involving over 9,000 patients were included, but the target glucose was lower, ranging from less than 160 to less than 180. In the randomized control trials, the odds of developing any SSI was reduced by 87% in the IV insulin group, with only one study showing no significant difference. In the cohort studies, tight glycemic control with continuous IV insulin yielded a net reduction of 65% for SSIs with a range from 46 to 75% in all the studies. In terms of readmission, there was a trend towards reduced readmission in the continuous IV insulin group with only 12% compared to 24% in the bolus insulin group. This had a p-value of 0.052. Thus, we can see from this review that strict glycemic control with continuous IV insulin to achieve a target blood sugar of less than 180 significantly reduces SSIs in the cardiac surgery population. The impact of this practice on overall readmission rates is difficult to assess because most cardiac surgery programs in the U.S. already use this protocol. However, stricter adherence to this guideline may decrease future avoidable infections. A second overall treatment strategy to reduce readmissions involves prevention of the retained blood syndrome. This entity was recently coined by Boyle et al., and refers to a constellation of complications that result from incomplete post-surgical blood drainage from the pleural and pericardial spaces. The obvious clinical scenario of excessive bleeding causing pericardial tamponade or pleural hematoma is excluded. The focus is on patients in whom the ratio of bleeding to blood drainage is slightly imbalanced or the chest tube becomes obstructed with clot in such a way that puddles of blood clot can accumulate within the pericardial or pleural spaces. These collections trigger a cascade of inflammatory changes which produce excessive quantities of vascular endothelial growth factor. VEGF is a cytokine that increases pleural and pericardial permeability, which in turn causes exudative pleural and pericardial effusions. The increase in size of these effusions as well as their after-drainage growth may be explained by high concentrations of VEGF in these small retained blood collections. This retained clot VEGF hypothesis is a persuasive explanation for the occurrence of effusions that require pericardiosynthesis and thoracentesis in 10% of patients. Thus, preventing blood clot accumulation may reduce more than one postoperative complication. Remanaging the retained blood syndrome is multifactorial. Consistent with STS guidelines, preventing RBS begins with avoiding elective or urgent cabbage within five days of discontinuation of clopidogrel and other permanent platelet-inhibiting agents. Operative measures of meticulous hemostasis and adequate chest tube drainage are important. In the early postoperative phase, maintaining chest tube patency and more liberal re-exploration for excessive bloody drainage to identify bleeding points and perform mediastinal and pleural washout may be indicated. Pre-discharge thoracentesis for early pleural effusions that increase in size to more than 25% of the thoracic volume would complete the bundle of measures designed to prevent the complications resulting from retained blood. Despite the effectiveness in treating myocardial ischemia, cabbage does not eliminate the necessity to manage fluid overload and congestive heart failure in the postoperative phase. Optimal management requires categorizing patients according to their perioperative LV function. Loop diuretics should be used in all patients to counterbalance the tendency towards fluid retention in the early postoperative period. They are likewise necessary to achieve and maintain euvolemia in patients with chronic heart failure. 
Aldosterone antagonists are frequently added to improve diastolic dysfunction in addition to augmenting diuresis. ACE inhibitors are best for patients with the LVEF less than 40% and routine antihypertensive agents are used for patients with EF greater than 40% to prevent systolic blood pressure spikes. Beta blockers are good to prevent tachycardia for both groups, but calcium channel blockers should be avoided in patients with an ejection fraction less than 40%. New onset atrial fibrillation is the most common complication following heart surgery. In cabbage patients, 95% of cases occur within three days of surgery. The incidence of new AF ranges between 15 to 40% and can be modulated by preoperative beta blockers. Up to 80% of the cases of new onset AFib terminate within 24 hours, never to occur again if adequate beta blockade is on board. Drugs that are thought to be effective in preventing atrial fibrillation and heart surgery ranges from statins to amiodarone to all-generation beta blockers. However, there are a few large-scale studies that demonstrate superiority of one agent over another. Despite some negative recent reviews, it is still considered reasonable to initiate beta blocker therapy preoperatively and maintain it through at least the first six postoperative weeks. Amiodarone has been shown to reduce the incidence of new onset AFib by 50%, but much of this benefit is attenuated by a higher rate of sustained post-op bradycardia requiring temporary cardiac pacing. Once AF has lasted longer than 24 hours, the primary goal of therapy is to achieve satisfactory rate control such that the resting heart rate is less than 90 and the exertional heart rate, preferably after a six-minute walk, is less than 125. Many patients require early multidrug therapy with a beta blocker and amiodarone or calcium channel blocker to meet these heart rate goals and prevent long periods of heart rate greater than 130. Rarely, patients need electrical cardioversion for sustained heart rate greater than 140 with or without hypotension. Anticoagulation with Coumadin is indicated for multiple episodes of AF or a single episode lasting longer than 24 to 48 hours. Bridging anticoagulation with IV heparin is not indicated unless the patient has a prior history of thromboembolic event. Anticoagulation should be maintained for four to six weeks after the onset of AFib. The final post-op complication that could be better managed prior to discharge is pleural effusion. Within 30 days of surgery, 10% of patients develop pleural effusions that occupy more than 20% of the left hemithorax. The impact of this fluid collection on a patient's respiratory status depends on many factors, including pre-op pulmonary function, associated COPD, degree of underlying atelectasis, and frailty. Only half of these patients who develop large pleural fusions require thoracentesis for symptomatic improvement or improved lung expansion. Prior to thoracentesis, large pleural fusion should be differentiated from lobar atelectasis and diaphragmatic paralysis with pleural ultrasound. Rosengard et al. from Stony Brook have advocated pre-discharge ultrasound-guided thoracentesis for large effusions, i.e. greater than 25% hemithorax, preemptively drain the fluid accumulation to prevent readmission for management of the same problem. Many studies have elaborated risk models to identify factors that are predictive of readmission. In most, socioeconomic status and insurance coverage are the most significant factors associated with high readmission rates. To focus on the clinical factors in this Medicare population, David Shaheen et al. used a nationally representative approach by linking CMS claim records with patients in the SDS National Cardiac Database who had undergone isolated cabbage. From 2008 to 2010, over 162,000 patients were identified who underwent cabbage at 850 U.S. hospitals. Logistic and hierarchical regression models were used to identify risk factors for readmission. The table shows the top 10 clinical parameters most predictive of readmission within 30 days of discharge. Some patterns emerged from considering them in the context of known causes of readmission. Three of the ten pertain to conditions that confer a higher susceptibility to infection, namely end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, immunosuppression, and insulin-dependent diabetes. Three of the ten are surrogates for either deconditioned or constitutional frailty in the surgical population, 
such as older age, especially greater than 75, BMI less than 21 in men, and deconditioned obesity in women. Three of the 10 are cardiopulmonary factors which are associated with respiratory insufficiency or heart failure in the post-op population. Only three of the 10 are significant risk factors for operative mortality. This fact further emphasizes the notion that different strategies are necessary to prevent excessive readmissions along the pathway to long-term survival. Four benefits seem to result from proactively identifying one or more of these risk factors in the cabbage population. The first is conscientious implementation of guidelines in combination with nuanced adjustment for comorbidities. An example would be monitoring excessive diuresis and worsening renal function in patients in heart failure who are prescribed a diuretic and ACE inhibitor. Secondly, treat these patients with a higher index of suspicion for complications because of their susceptibility to multiple problems. Third, for frail patients, identify those who would benefit from intermediate care or use discharge planning to coordinate outpatient PT and nursing resources if they are discharged home. Finally, Harlem Crumholz et al. have identified a group of patients who are readmitted after hospitalizations for heart failure who do not have any specific disease state or physiological abnormality that requires readmission. They simply are unable to readjust to outpatient life. This has been labeled the post-hospital syndrome and it's been a primary diagnosis in up to 30% of patients readmitted after treatment for CHF. A similar problem occurs with older patients who are frail but well compensated at home and undergo urgent cabbage. Discharge home results in readmission to manage a similar post-surgical variant of the heart failure post-hospital syndrome. Awareness of this entity will help with more effective discharge planning. Readmissions after isolated cabbage are due to a combination of unresolved postoperative problems, new complications that develop after discharge, or the consequences of surgical stress superimposed on chronic diseases. I have outlined strategies that are designed to improve management of problems responsible for avoidable readmissions. Listed is a checklist that summarizes discharge criteria that have been distilled from the management guidelines discussed in this presentation. These are to be sure on the day of discharge that thorough physical examination discloses no signs of wound infection. All post-op complications not covered in the checklist should be resolved. This includes AFib with RVR, chemical or clinical renal insufficiency, pneumothorax, symptomatic anemia, etc. Glycemic control. Diabetics should have good control defined as glucometer readings less than 180 to 200 every six hours when controlled with subcutaneous insulin boluses if insulin dependent or oral antihypoglycemic agent. Number three, absence of heart failure. This should be done by determining the absence of ankle swelling, no evidence of pulmonary congestion on chest x-ray, a body weight within 5% of preoperative level, and tolerating heart failure meds appropriate for the type of heart failure diagnosed. Stable heart rhythm. If patient is in atrial fibrillation, the resting heart rate should be less than 90 and the exercise heart rate should be less than 130. If the patient is in sinus rhythm, no evidence of advanced heart block on rhythm strips and a heart rate greater than 80. Sustainable pulmonary status. The chest x-ray should be clear or if a pleural effusion is present, it should occupy less than 25% of the hemithorax. Bronchodilator or supplemental oxygen therapy for COPD may be necessary as determined by the patient's pulmonologist. Adequacy of ventilatory reserve is demonstrated by independent ambulation for short distances outside of the patient's room without respiratory distress. Number six, multidisciplinary determination of best destination, i.e. home, intermediate care facility, or skilled nursing facility should be done a day or two prior to anticipated discharge. If the patient is discharged home, a need for outpatient physiotherapy should be done, and the visiting nurse or other daily needs for support should be prescribed. Finally, a discharge summary with current performance description and outline of medications, follow-up appointments, as well as activity recommendations should be completed and routed to the patient's doctors to improve communication. Many readmissions have been documented in the literature as being unilateral initiated by the patient's doctors who are unaware of their progress with surgery 
and they're just concerned about their condition in their post-operative state. Communication with discharge summary and or by telephone should hopefully alleviate this problem. The next section of this webinar is on readmission strategies and outcomes. I'm Kevin Lobdell, the Director of Quality at Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute. I would like to take a moment to thank the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and its members, the Task Force on Quality Improvement, and my collaborators, Drs. Payone, Shaheen, Shannon, and Kane. Our quality improvement program began in 2004. We've patterned our efforts after those high-performance organizations which we've studied and collaborated with extensively. We believe that these high-performance organizations have common aspirational goals, alignment of a guiding coalition, accountability, and emphasize learning quickly and continuously improving. Our clinical efforts are proactive, interactive, and precise. We make multidisciplinary rounds twice daily and utilize goal sheets. In addition, we use checklists, and these efforts have been highlighted by the advisory board. We developed point-of-care databases to allow for compliance, monitoring, and real-time learning. We meet every two weeks to discuss our outcomes as well as the compliance with the processes we've outlined. Our analyses have been subjected to peer review, and we found that we had a 40% reduction in mortality as well as marked improvement in morbidity as well as early extubation and resource utilization. Our largest program has received three stars by the SDS in five of 11 periods, and we've replicated these efforts in our two other facilities. Readmission reduction is an emphasis for Carolina's healthcare system. We focused on risk assessment, clinical care management, transitions in care, and our skilled nursing facility and home health community collaborative. The Charlotte Metro Group of Carolina's healthcare system evaluated its readmission rates. While our readmissions were better than average, we felt that we could improve considerably. A readmission reduction group was chartered and structured. Our efforts were within the acute care work. Existing models of readmission risk assessment were evaluated. Carolina's healthcare system worked with prediction software to build a highly predictive model. This model was designed to look at 30-day readmissions, was patient-specific, and it is dynamic. Our readmission and length of stay risk models include key variables in the domains of demographics, comorbidities, psychosocial issues, and utilization. In addition, the risk models include laboratory values, vital signs, and medications. Our proprietary readmission risk model is better than any other predictive model found in the published literature. Our risk model has been validated and allows for categorization into very high, high, medium, and low readmission risk. Our clinical care managers have a view whereby they see a patient list, patient interventions, recommended interventions, and then we track the selected interventions. Clinical care management begins this process before seeing a patient, and the automation decreases variation and is updated hourly. As I mentioned previously, the recommendations are assigned automatically, and we track the interventions. Our clinical work group works on length of stay, readmissions, and value. We make use of clinical databases like the Society of Thoracic Surgeons National Cardiac Database as well as Premier, the prediction readmission effort, and Tableau for visualization. Our clinical work group has segregated efforts into in-hospital strategies, disease-related strategies, discharge follow-up, discharge patient resources, and emergency department visits. Again, these efforts have been highlighted in the advisory board publication. An important part of the readmission reduction strategies include risk assessment and mitigation strategies for stroke, prolonged ventilation, and renal failure. 
We've partnered with our system's telehealth efforts, as well as the heart success model for heart failure readmission reductions. Our virtual critical care and telehealth efforts are co-located. Our most recent efforts to reduce readmissions include a transition clinic and our digital health efforts. We have the ability to track heart rate, rhythm, blood pressure, weights, depths, oxygen saturations, and a variety of other simple digital tools. We believe that the future will soon allow us to monitor biomarkers as well. In 2015, our mean length of stay for coronary artery bypass was 6.6 days, while the median was 6. 41.6% of our patients spent less than 6 days, and our readmission rate was 6.3%. The readmission rates for our cardiac surgery programs in Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute ranged from 6.1% to 7.5% in 2015. We strongly believe that success often comes from doing common things and commonly well. We've emphasized teamwork, keeping score, learning quickly, continuously improving, and also believe that it's important to tell the world about our efforts. All of this is resulted in an upward spiral of success. Again, I'd like to thank the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, as well as our patients and our team. Hi, this is Bill Kane. I'm a cardiac surgeon at Intermountain Medical Center in Salt Lake City, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to share with you our efforts at reducing readmissions following coronary artery bypass grafting. Readmissions after cardiac surgery are a significant problem. As Dr. Shaheen outlined earlier, they are associated with higher mortality and significantly increased health care costs. Currently, the 30-day readmission rate in the STS database is approximately 10%. If we can improve our transition of care strategies, that will allow us to reduce our readmission rates and improve our outcomes and the quality of care we provide. Our readmission rates are scrutinized more and more all the time and will eventually be publicly reported and have increasing impacts on our reimbursement. I'd like to just share with you how our efforts at reducing readmissions evolved here at Intermountain Medical Center. Once again, none of us really felt like our readmission rate had increased, but periodically reviewing our STS data demonstrated to us that our readmission rate, for some reason, had gone up significantly. I think these periodic reviews of STS data are critical in helping us provide the highest quality of care. You can see from our 2013 STS report that our readmission rate had jumped up significantly. As Dr. Shaheen demonstrated earlier, multiple risk factors for readmission have been outlined in the medical literature. We wanted to figure out what we could do to decrease our readmission rate. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services published a readmission prediction model that had a significant degree of accuracy. However, it was based on claims data, much of which isn't available to us until after our patient is discharged. So we thought we'd look at our own data from our Intermountain system and find out what our STS data could tell us about how to predict which patients were at highest risk for readmission. Intermountain Healthcare is a 22 hospital system based in Salt Lake City, Utah, which employs approximately 1,400 physicians at more than 185 hospitals and clinics throughout Utah and neighboring states. Four of these hospitals have cardiac surgical programs, and Intermountain Medical Center is Intermountain Healthcare's flagship institution, and we are the quaternary referral center for our other cardiac surgical programs. We decided to look at patients across all four of Intermountain's cardiac surgical programs. We used all the STS database version 2.73 registered patients, which gave us a grand total of 1,607 isolated coronary artery bypass patients. We then analyzed 59 readily obtainable data elements that were available to us preoperatively to help us determine readmission risk. 
So of these 1,607 isolated coronary bypass patients across the Intermountain system, 147, or 9.15% of these patients were readmitted. After performing a multivariate analysis, we found five variables that were statistically significant that helped us predict 30-day readmission rates. The odds, ratios, and p-values are reported here. First, for every year of age above 65, the odds of readmission increased by 2.7%. Patients with heart failure symptoms within two weeks of their surgery had a 55% increased risk of readmission. The odds of readmission increased by approximately 45% for patients with a low serum albumin level on admission or for patients who had had a previous myocardial infarction. And the odds of readmission for diabetics were almost 55% greater. The C statistic of these data was 0.63, which is comparable to that of the CMS readmission model I referenced earlier. We then validated this readmission prediction model prospectively with 539 isolated coronary bypass patients. We ran this analysis on all the patients and then compared those who were readmitted to those who were not. This analysis showed us that the readmitted patients were predicted to be significantly higher risk for readmission than those who were not. So now that we have this information, how do we act on it to improve our readmission rate? I believe that the key to success of this and all of our quality improvement initiatives is our monthly multidisciplinary process improvement meeting. At this meeting, everyone sits around the table who is involved in the care of the cardiac surgical patients. It is often said that cardiac surgery is a team sport, and I really believe that is true. Listed here are all the caregivers who attend this process improvement meeting. At these meetings, representatives from each of these groups can raise concerns and can share information over the processes of care for which they are responsible. It is at this monthly meeting when we review our STS data reports together. So now we want to take the variables that we outlined earlier and help them identify high-risk patients. Therefore, we know that patients are more likely to be readmitted if they are diabetic, if they've had heart failure symptoms within the prior two weeks, if they've suffered a prior myocardial infarction, if they have poor nutritional status, and also if they're deconditioned or have poor family or social support, or if they're quite frail. Identifying these high-risk patients preoperatively is only the first step. We need to spend the rest of each patient's hospitalization helping to prevent an eventual readmission. Each patient's discharge needs are assessed and reassessed throughout their hospital stay. Each member of the team then focuses on ensuring safe transitions of care, for example, when the patient is transferred from the intensive care unit to the regular floor. We then rely heavily on our acute care nurses to provide excellent discharge teaching so the patients know how to manage their medications and where to turn for help if they need it. We've also empowered our physician assistants to arrange any follow-up they think might be necessary in these high-risk patients. Some of the things they may arrange would include early telephone calls from our office to check on the patients following discharge, arranging early home health nursing visits, and also arranging early clinic follow-up visits. Remember from Dr. Shahian's presentation that the most common day for readmission is post-discharge day five, so early interventions are very important. We've also spread the word throughout the hospital so that any patient who comes back to the emergency department or who gets readmitted is immediately brought to the attention of that patient's surgeon, and hopefully readmission is then avoided. Integral in the process of reducing readmission is giving each patient a detailed and clear set of instructions at the time of discharge. This includes a list of their diagnoses, a detailed list of their medications, dosages, frequency, and also a detailed list of phone numbers so the patient knows who to contact if they have problems or questions. We also schedule follow-up appointments for each patient with their primary care physician, their cardiologist, and with their cardiac surgeon before they leave the hospital. Home health visits have recently been shown to be a very effective way of reducing readmission. Again, because readmission usually occurs early, we strive to visit patients within three to four days of discharge. Visiting nurses will review the patient's medications with them, 
They will examine the patient looking for common problems such as volume overload, arrhythmias, and evidence of infection, and the home health nurses have a clear point of contact so they know where to turn when they identify problems. Many of our higher risk patients, patients with poor family or social support, and patients who are frail end up being discharged to a skilled nursing facility. These extended care facilities need to be used with care, however. Recent studies have suggested that patients discharged to these facilities are actually 50% more likely to require readmission than patients who are discharged to home. My experience with skilled nursing facilities is that patients can receive occupational, physical, and speech therapy very effectively. However, general medical care is less reliable because nurses are spread very thin, sometimes one for 20 patients or more, and physicians visit on a once a week basis or less. Here at Intermountain, we have a new pilot program to work with the skilled nursing facilities that serve our patients to help them recognize problems early and help to reduce our readmissions. This effort is being spearheaded by our congestive heart failure clinic, and we are working with them to help reduce coronary bypass surgery readmissions. You can see from our most recent STS report that the measures we've taken have helped us to reduce our readmission rate significantly down to around the 7 to 8% level. Of course, we hope that with some of our longer term interventions that we will see this readmission rate continue to decline. This completes the webinar. Please send any questions or comments to Sydney Clinton at the email address listed. We thank you for taking the time to view the webinar and hope you found it informative and useful to your practice. As are all of the other previous STS webinars, this presentation will be posted and available in the quality section of the STS website. Thank you.